Okay, this video is obesity causes. This is part nine, and we're gonna be talking about obesogenic chemicals and endocrine disrupting chemicals, which are usually um, estrogenic chemicals. Um, so obesogen is a word meaning a chemical that causes obesity. And that coin was termed by Bruce Bloomberg, uh, PhD, the scientist who's done a lot of research on obesogens. He started out doing his work on something called tributyl tin, which is a type of paint that was painted on the undersurface of boats to prevent barnacles from growing on them. And they found out that it was having estrogenic effects on the <clears throat> local uh, marine life. Okay, so basically, you know, a woman needs estrogen to develop her secondary sexual characteristics, the breasts and the reproductive system. However, when the estrogens are present in excessive amounts, they cause lots of side effects. In particular, estrogen is a fat storage hormone. So they tell the body to gain more weight to save that for the baby in case the baby needs that for energy. But when a woman has excessive energy as she gets older, she increases her risk of breast cancer, uterine fibroid tumors, you know, leiomyomas, uh, endometriosis, excessive menses, um, endometrial carcinoma, um, high estrogenic levels will prevent ovulation, so infertility, um, and then it can cause effects on the babies and men. It can lower their testosterone. Okay, so let's just talk real quick. You got to know this about the estrogen receptor, and I've talked about estrogenic chemicals in several lectures before, but the emphasis on this one today will be on the way estrogen causes obesity, estrogenic chemicals. So here's the chemical structure of cholesterol, and there's four rings. They're called the A, B, C, D rings and there's a hydroxyl group on there. So the all in choline, because it goes into bile, stere, because it's a steroid, steroid, all because there's an alcohol group on there, our hydroxyl group, same thing for our purposes. So that's the polar part of it, and this is the nonpolar part of cholesterol. So you can see there's you know 27 carbons that are all nonpolar, so cholesterol is able to fit itself into plasma membranes, and then the polar component is, you know, is sort of analogous to the phospholipid polar head in a plasma membrane, for example. The relevance here is that cholesterol is the backbone structure for the estrogenic hormones in the human body. So here's estradiol. So you look at the name, think of the ester as just being like a female for our purposes. Di is two, all is uh, the two hydroxyl groups. So one and two hydroxyl groups. The hydroxyl group over here is attached to a benzene ring, which means a cyclohexane with three double bonds. And these double bonds rotate around. You can use the word resonate. And what that means is that the electrons can move through all six of these carbons, in a sense, through what are called pi orbitals. And all that means is there's tremendous shelf stability. Um, so this thing can stay on the shelf for years and not spoil, which is perfect for a company. The hydroxyl group is antimicrobial, which is perfect for a preservative. And that's why these things are in everything. You literally can't get rid of these chemicals. They're worth billions of dollars, and they'll just make some new variation on it if you ban any one of them. So this combination of a benzene ring with hydroxyl group together, they're called a phenol, and it is like the super preservative. It's in tons of personnel care products. It's in all the plastics. Here's bisphenol A, the most famous estrogenic chemical used for making plastics. You can see there's a phenol group over here, a phenol group over here. And let's say you got just some carbons in the center, and people, you know, started to realize bisphenol A had very strong estrogenic activities, and it was getting into people's blood and urine and their fat cells. So they said, "Oh, we should ban BPA." Big deal. The company just puts a sulfur or something else in the center there, and it's still estrogenic. And that's what I mean by don't waste your time thinking that these are ever going to go away. All you can do is learn how to recognize them and avoid them. And probably the best overall strategy is being minimalist because otherwise you're going to be exposed to a lot of estrogen chemicals. The estrogenic chemical, like here's estradiol, it forms a hydrogen bond with an estrogen receptor. And the estrogen receptor is not that fussy about what's attached to the phenol group. And because of this, there's lots and lots of chemicals that have estrogenic properties interacting with the estrogen receptor. Now the next thing is, how does the body excrete estrogen? Well, one of the ways it does is estrogen goes to the liver and then it undergoes two phases of detoxification. The first phase of the estrogen uh, removal from the human body is it's hydroxylated. So adding an OH group on there, a hydroxyl group, makes it more polar. 
And then the second phase of detoxidation is to add what's called a glucuronic acid, which for our purposes, just think of a glucuronic acid being like uh, glucose plus a carboxylic acid. Okay, that's all we need to know for our purposes. That's close enough. Um, and again, these are when estrogen levels in the blood are high, the livers, which is the metabolic workhouse factory of the human body, will hydroxylate and glucuronidate or conjugate the estrogen and excrete it into the bile. And then it passes out to the colon, and normally we defecate it out of our bodies, and that's how we lower our levels of estrogen in the human body. However, there's a problem, and here's the problem. Normal gut bacteria for humans are based on a diet very high in fiber, and that yields a good gut microbiome, good gut bacteria. There's really two main categories of gut bacteria. There's, let's call them the good and the bad. The good gut bacteria come from eating a plant-based diet because all the fiber feeds the good gut bacteria. And we've been symbiotic with good gut bacteria, you know, since humans were placed on this planet. And they like living in our colon. It's a great apartment for them. So they want us to be happy. They want to keep us healthy. They are symbiotic with us, meaning mutually beneficial. We give the good gut bacteria fiber, and in exchange, they do a lot of helpful things for us. And one of the things they do is they convert the fiber into short-chain fatty acids, including butyrate. And the butyrate is used to maintain the gut lining with tight junctions so we don't get leaky gut. So they protect us from leaky gut. Okay, the next thing is that when you have the bad bacteria, so this, the second type of gut microbiome, we'll just call it the bad gut bacteria. That's what you get from eating meat and processed food. Now, those bacteria haven't been living in human colons that long. So they're not symbiotic with us. They don't really care if we live or die. And one of the problems with these bacteria is they have more of an enzyme called glucuronidase. And this glucuronidase will cut the bond between glucose and the estrogen. So once the glucuronic acid is separated, so here they are conjugated, here they are separated. Once they're separated, the estrogen is reabsorbed into the human body, into the blood. So a person who has eats a lot of processed food and meat will have more of these bad bacteria with a glucuronidase enzyme in increased amounts and they're going to reabsorb their estrogen and they're going to have higher estrogen levels. Um, I've had women tell me every single woman in their family had fibroid tumors of the uterus requiring a hysterectomy before the age of 35. Um, and so you ask yourself why? Because I know these, these people in their families, they eat, they eat a lot of meat, processed food, and um, they drink tap water, okay? So all of those things are going to increase estrogen levels. Tap water increases estrogen levels because it's too expensive for municipal, municipal water filtration to filter out the estrogens. And by the way, having a hysterectomy before the age of 35 is not good because you lose that monthly menstruation, a therapeutic phlebotomy, and they therefore are at increased risk for atherosclerosis, hypertension, for stroke, premature dementia. Whenever I get a female brain, that's demented, you know, prematurely, let's say before 65, and there's no good reason for it. She's not a smoker or an alcoholic. Um, I'll usually find out that she had a hysterectomy before age 35. Mayo Clinic did a study on about 2,000 patients and showed that women who have hysterectomies, the younger the worse it is, and before 35 years of age in general, they have a lot of increased, you know, cardiovascular health problems and other health problems. Okay, so the main estrogen in the human body is, for premenopausal women, estradiol, with a di meaning two, so two hydroxy groups, that's called E2. Um, estrone has only one, that's called E1. Estri, tri as in three, has three, so that's called E3. And by the way, the main birth control pill we all hear about is EE2, ethinyl estradiol. Um, let's see. Normally in the female body, she has 20 to 40, 20 to 400 picograms. So that's 20 to 400 picograms of estrogen per milliliter, you know. And the relevance is, and men, by the way, are similar. We're similar to the woman when she's at her lowest amount. We have about 20 picograms per milliliter of estrogen in, in a man's blood. So what's the point? The point is that these estrogenic chemicals that we're exposed to in the environment even if they might have less ability to activate the estrogen receptor in the human body, they can be present in thousands of picograms per milliliter. So orders of magnitude higher than the blood levels of our normal estrogen hormones. So they can activate estrogen receptors and potentially cause problems with uh, reproductive development and with all these diseases associated with excessive estrogen levels. 
Okay, um, this is an article about screening system for obesogenic compounds. And by the way, the, these estrogenic compounds tend to activate what is called the PPAR gamma receptor. It has a long fancy name, peroxisome proliferator activated receptor gamma, but just PPAR gamma, just, it's good to know that because that just comes up a lot. Here's a real quick sense of what's going on with the power bends. So power bends are a super common preservative. And you know, here's just a nomenclature. So here you have an aromatic ring, like a benzene ring, and we have a dominant substituent up here. And then there's a question of what's the name for the second substituent on the benzene ring. If it comes off adjacent right here, it looks like an I, and that's called the ortho position. So I drew a dot in the center like an I. If it comes off the next position adjacent, that's called the meta position or the M position. I drew a mustache there because it looks like a face. So you can think of the eyes being up here and then the mustache here for meta position. When it's directly um, opposite of the dominant substituent there, you have a, it's called a para position. So, and this is a benzoic acid. So this is a para benzoic acid. And just for, there's a whole bunch of different types of para bends. But just so you know where that's coming from, what that's about, I think of it the P for power protruding like a beard. Um, and the typical personal care product would be deodorant. Deodorant will have parbenzoic acids for preservatives quite commonly. And then it'll have uh, aluminum, which is a metalloestrogen. A metalloestrogen, we don't know a lot of times exactly how it activates the estrogen pathway, but it increases estrogenic type effects in the human body. Um, so, you know, you'll see in a lot of products, paraben-free, meaning none of these parabenzoic acids. Parabens also can interfere with the thyroid function, and that's a problem with some of these estrogenic chemicals is they can also have a, a detrimental effect on the thyroid. So you don't want that. Like soy is a class example. It's estrogenic, and it has an anti-thyroid effect. Okay, this is just a quick list. I got this idea. It reminded me of the periodic table of the elements. So I made this periodic table of estrogenics. And there's tons of them. So in the foods and the plants, we'll talk about these. And personal care products, you know, they're just basically be a minimalist on personal care products because they probably have at least one, if not two or more estrogen there. Um, eat organic so you avoid the herbicide and pesticide uh, estrogenic chemicals. Um, detergents and soaps. Use what you have to, but be kind of a bit of a minimalist on it. For example, I just do my laundry with hot water and I prolong drying phase. I don't put any detergent on it because a typical detergent is going to contain something like nonylphenol. Non is in nine carbons with a phenyl group on it. Um, and then the, it's going to be in a BPA-made plastic bottle or some equivalent to BPA. And that uh, plastic bottle is going to be conditioned with phthalate. So right there, just to wash your clothes, three estrogens. And then the wrinkle, anti-wrinkle squares that are thrown into the dryer are typically estrogenic. So that's four estrogenics. And if those are on your clothes, they're going to be in contact with your skin being transdermally absorbed all day long. Okay, now people sometimes say to me, oh, why do you go on and on about these chemicals? Who cares? Well, the reason is lots of people are fat and sick and they're very sad and unhappy. They've got breast cancer. They're infertile. Uh, they're obese. You know, and they wish they weren't. And so what I'm saying is, here's the answer. You know, there's no magic medication or surgery that's going to make all these problems go away, okay? You think bariatric surgery is fun? Having your stomach sliced and, and squeezed and potentially having all kinds of malabsorption problems or real nutrient problems? You know, if you have to do that, you have to do that. There is a time and a place for it. But if you can fix your health just by avoiding a couple chemicals, and improving your diet, I mean, that's a great deal. Okay, some of these miscellaneous chemicals like from Teflon, you know, when you fry food in one of those non-stick pot containers, flame retardants. So this is why I don't wear the blue surgical gowns unless I need to when I'm doing a procedure because I don't want to be putting myself in contact with a flame retardant. If I'm not going to use cautery and it's a minor procedure, you know, you don't need to put the flame retardant gown on. Um... Let's say you're doing a suture removal, for example. Why put a flame retardant gown on? You know, you wear sterile gloves, wear a non flame retardant gown. You don't expose yourself to this stuff. Uh, PCBs is something that's gotten the water. They stick around for a long time. Poly polychloro biphenyls, anything that has the word benzyl or phenyl in it, is probably going to be 
one of these estrogenic chemicals. You don't want to live near where they have an incinerator burning garbage or other things that's toxic for you. Um, some of these clothings are polyester terephthalate. We talked about the tributyl tin. That was the research of Dr. Bloomberg. Um, and there's just a couple other ones that are estrogens or metalloestrogens. Okay, this one right here is cleaning chemical estrogen. So a big one to know about is nonylphenol. So non means nine in terms of chemistry uh, nomenclature. And there's the phenol. So nine carbons attached to a phenol group. And there's your, it kind of looks like a giant sperm. There is your typical detergent, all right? And so what I'm saying is to avoid exposing yourself to this estrogen, you don't need laundry detergent. Like I have a lady doctor friend from Korea. She says, oh, they just boiled their laundry. It's not a big deal. Um, you know, like for example, and I don't like going to dry cleaners either. And, that, and that's just for different types of chemicals. I don't want to smell all that crap walking in there. We're not made for that. You know, everybody's scared of spiders and snakes, but people should be more scared of chemicals. And I see a lot of people, they work with toxic chemicals and they don't even open the door. That's stupid. If you're working with a toxic chemical, which everybody has to sometimes, open the door. Ventilate the room. You'll rapidly, you know, minimize the concentration of it. Okay. Oh, I see. Okay, let's see. Here. Actually, I'm going to show you a couple books real quick. Um, this book on endocrine disruption by Philippa Darby, it's a good book. Uh, she's a lady PhD in England who's done a lot of research on endocrine disrupting chemicals. This book here is by Estro Generation is by uh, Dr. Anthony J. He has a YouTube channel by the same name, Dr. Anthony J. And he's he's great. He's a fantastic. This is a fantastic, entertaining book, and he's a great expert on estrogenic chemicals. He's kind of young. I don't know how old he is. Maybe 40, 45 or something. So I don't think he knows much about nutrition. But yeah, I think you have to forgive all these people because hardly anybody knows much about nutrition because so you know, somebody can be great in biochemistry. He has a PhD in biochemistry on the subject of estrogen chemicals, but he's not going to know that much about nutrition. So anyways, I highly recommend that book. I think it's a masterpiece, and I think his videos at his YouTube channel, Dr. Anthony J., are quite good. The book by Philippe Darby is more of a formal textbook, whereas this is more of a fun book than anybody can understand, Estrogen Generation. And it's a great introduction to estrogen chemistry. Then when you want to read more about estrogen chemistry, Go to books like Philippe Darbray's sort of textbook on estrogen chemistry. And there's other ones out there, too. Okay, this is just showing that marijuana is estrogenic. So it's not a smart thing to do. It's neurotoxic and it's estrogenic. It feminizes you. You know, I have zero interest in that substance. I think it's bad news. I'd stay away from it. Okay, benzophenones. This is another type of estrogen typically found in sunscreens. And they've shown people use these sunscreens. They absorb them into their blood, and they stay in their blood for days. I would not. I don't ever use sunscreen. I think sunscreen's a big joke. I think it increases your risk of cancer. Is my prediction, my guess, based on what I've read about it. Um, and I wouldn't like these nanoparticles. Who knows how much of them are transdermally absorbed and what effect they're having inside the body? Okay. I, I have a separate video all about sunscreens. If you're interested in that, on what to choose. Oh, this is just one little joke from when I was in Stanford uh, in college. Um, you know, the old joke was in Stanford, 9 out of 10 California girls are pretty, and the 10th one goes to Stanford. I'd never seen such unattractive women in my whole life. And so, you know, my, I lived in an athlete fraternity my last two years there. And, um, you know, lots of guys who were used to having girlfriends in high school didn't have girlfriends in college at Stanford. But also athletes were kind of low status at Stanford compared to other places, especially football players and wrestlers. I mean, there would be articles in the newspapers, why do we give scholarships to football players and wrestlers? They're just a bunch of thugs. And it was like, I couldn't believe it. It was very, like the opposite of high school. In high school, people respect the football players, especially are like celebrities, and the wrestlers too are respected. You know, they're the guys that fight for their school. Okay, but it wasn't like that at Stanford. Um, there were, you know, like I said, there were articles in the newspaper wanting to get rid of uh, athletic scholarships. Okay, uh, I lived in the fraternity, same one as um, Jim Plunkett and John Elway, Super Bowl quarterbacks, had lived earlier. Um, and so, anyways, this one guy, he had, he was known as the matchmaker. He had a whole big stack of these magazines in his room. And uh, so, anyways, one night we're having pizza in his room. And there was no napkin around, so there's just a towel on the floor. And I picked up the napkin, and I wiped the grease off the cheek. And he goes, dude, what are you doing with my spank rag? 
And it's like, oh God, how disgusting is this? Okay. Okay, here's a red dye number 40. And the point being is this is an estrogenic chemical. And all these, you know, numerical numbers for these food dyes, they're just euphemisms, typically for complex petroleum-based chemicals. These things are toxic. You don't want to be feeding your kid this stuff because the kids are attracted to, you know, the candies and stuff. But this stuff is really bad for them. And different food dyes have been associated with hyperactive behavior, attention deficit behavior, anxiety, depression, decreased cognitive function. So you don't want to be eating this stuff. You really don't want to eat any processed food. There's nothing good about it for you. We talked earlier briefly about there's lots of estrogenic chemicals in the water. And they, the municipal water filtration is not going to remove them. You have to uh, remove them yourself. And it's easy. It's cheap. You can, you know, it's best to have a whole house carbon water filter. You should at the very least have one in your kitchen. And so, you know, also I think all the stuff about you must drink eight cups of water a day is totally stupid. Because think about it. You know, you're going to have a 300-pound football lineman. Does he need eight cups the same as an 80-pound woman? No. Different size people. You know, everybody can go by their thirst. In addition, what kind of water are you drinking? If you're just drinking tap water, then you're drinking water that's full of chlorine that has an antimicrobial effect on your gut, can contribute to leaky gut. Plus, you're drinking all these estrogenic chemicals that can promote obesity. Because I see some of these fat women, they're kind of sad and pathetic, walking around with their water bottle trying to lose weight. And they're drinking this water out of a plastic water bottle, like a PET, polyethylene terephthalate estrogen, the water itself, a lot of times, it's not filtered, so it's full of estrogen. It's going to make them gain weight, even though there's no calories in it. So I kind of feel sorry for them. So like I said, carbon filter will remove the estrogens, and that'll help you to avoid these fat storage hormones that make you gain weight. You know, Even when you eat the same amount of food, you'll be heavier when you're exposed to a lot of these estrogenic chemicals. Okay, here's soy, and soy, of course, is promoted as a health food, which I think is ridiculous. There's tons of papers. I've given lectures on this before, like, is soy a health food, showing all the problems with soy. And, you know, soy and flax have many, 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 many thousands of times more estrogenic chemicals in them than other foods. And the question is why? Like, look at this uh, beautiful lady over here. She's got, you know, breasts. She's got a Virginia. You She's got a reproductive system. It's very understandable why she needs estrogen. There's no breasts on a soy plant. There's no Virginia on a soy plant. Why does it have such off-the-charts levels of estrogen? Because it doesn't want to be eaten. So it makes the animal eat it infertile so it'll stop reproducing. And then the, the plant hopes that it won't be bothered anymore by that animal. It can also have an antithyroid effect. So it'll make the animal fat and fertile and stupid. Okay? And that's why I always think it's funny. There's all these people that are so, you know, pro-soy, promoting soy. And even they even wouldn't let me in a Facebook group because I criticized soy once. And I'm like, they're a joke, you know, just aggressive ignorance trying to make themselves infertile. I think that's stupid. And the, the type of stuff you get in this country is not the same as some, you know, person, person in Asia who grows a little bit in their backyard and eats less than 5% of their diet from that stuff. The typical modern stuff, GMO sprayed with herbicides like glyphosate, and it's also, um, you know, processed quite often with hexane neural toxin. Yeah, that's real healthy, brilliant. Okay, here's flax. Flax is even much, 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 much more estrogenic than soy, and soy is off the charts estrogenic. These are really high amounts of estrogen. I mean, I just made made these other beans here visible so you could see them, but they're minuscule in comparison with the amount of estrogen. And soy. Soy estrogen are isoflavones. Um, the flax estrogens are lignans. And the isoflavones, you know, you'll hear, oh, well, it activates mostly the estrogen receptor beta, not so much the estrogen receptor alpha. It still activates the estrogen receptor alpha. I talk all about that in my other lecture. I go through the receptors. I go through the Mueller paper. So it's still a significant thing, and it can have um, really high blood levels like we talked about. This is just one paper here showing that there could be how many thousands of times higher the levels of estrogenic chemicals are. This is total phytoestrogens in soy and in flax compared to other foods. They're off the charts higher. Well, here's just a paper showing there's cyanogenic-like chemicals in flaxseed, also in almonds and sorghum. So how significant is that? I don't know, but that certainly doesn't 
make me eager to eat that food. Okay, here's one study showing that they just did biopsies of the fat tissue in humans, and they found 19 types of estrogenic chemicals. And that's like, remember what Dr. McDougall said, the fat you eat is the fat you wear. A lot of these fats are absorbed right into the body, they go right to the fats, and they're stored there, and they can have estrogenic effects. And so people accumulate these things over time. And the higher up you are in the food chain, the more tendency there is to accumulate these things. They'll give estrogenic chemicals to cattle because it's a fat storage hormone. It makes them grow faster. Um, and a lot of people go, oh, I want my kid to have whole fat milk when they're young because they need that extra fat. I don't think they should be drinking whole fat milk because a lot of times those cows are, are engineered to make milk while they're pregnant. So the estrogen levels are very high in whole milk. And a lot of kids go into puberty way before they're ready. And I think that's a major contributor to it. Okay, corn, corn, corn everywhere and atrazine. So this is a study where they're able to look at the different types of isotopes in carbon and nitrogen. And corn has a characteristic pattern. So what they could do is all these permutations of processed food and fast food that are served at the most common fast food restaurants here. They, they purchase 480 different types of fast food servings from all these major cities in the United States. And what they found out, for example, at one of these fast food places, this one was Wendy's, of 160 items they produced, every single one was made out of corn. <laughs> and that's funny. And it's, you know, and at the other places, most of them were made out of corn. So you can eat, you know, 20 different things at these fast food processed food places, and you're basically eating permutations of chemical products made out of corn. Um, sweetened quite often with high fructose corn syrup, which can often be contaminated with mercury. Um, and then the problem with the corn is it's not organic at these places, and it's going to be sprayed with atrazine, which is a major powerful estrogen chemical. Um, sometimes they said, they said GMO corn um, can sometimes be contaminated. According to this study, there's a high incidence of contamination you know, relatively speaking, with these chemicals here, including potentially formaldehyde, okay? Now, you know, that's just one study. Maybe it's not so much in other studies, but there's no redeeming quality for this stuff. There's no reason to eat this stuff. Atrazine causes mitochondrial dysfunction and insulin resistance. So atrazine's very commonly sprayed uh, herbicide on non-organic corn. This is the one that turns the male frogs into female frogs. And so that's routinely on your food. If you order non-organic food made out of corn, which is most processed food, you're probably getting exposed to atrazine. And it causes mitochondrial dysfunction. Anything that causes mitochondrial dysfunction, you know, will often cause increased insulin resistance. So here's some slides. Um, and in the normal soleus muscle, there's not much fat, and the mitochondria look pretty good. In an atrazine-fed animal here, and these biopsies, where did they come from? Um, okay, this was done with rats. Okay, so then when they biopsied the rat's uh, muscle in the one fed with the atrazine sprayed corn, there was a lot of fat in the muscle. They're fatter. And in addition, the mitochondria are damaged. Instead of having the normal folds and cristae, you've had little precipitated blobs of the cristae. And so that means those mitochondria are not working well. If they're not going to work well, Whereas animals are going to be more prone to insulin resistance. You need good functioning mitochondria and a low fat diet to avoid insulin resistance. So atrazine plus high fat diet causes insulin resistance, diabetes, and obesity. Okay, and then this, this article mentions that if you overlap the maps of geographic maps showing where there's high atrazine usage and high atrazine consumption, it'll correlate rather well with where there's the most obesity. So this is obesogenic stuff. It's feminizing and it's obesogenic. I mean, no guy wants that. No guy in his right mind wants that. I talk to guys all the time. They all want a higher testosterone level. They want to lift weights and be strong. There's no guy uh, who, you know, wants to make himself physically weaker of, of like the guys I know and I talk to about weightlifting and stuff. They all want to be stronger, you know, so lowering your testosterone level is going to make you weaker. So there's demasculinization effects, feminization effects on the male gonads by atrazine across vertebrate classes, meaning that it happens in multiple animals, including fish, amphibians, and reptiles. This guy right here, Tyrone Hay, is a pretty smart guy. He was, I think he had a scholarship to Harvard, and you know he found these results, and he published this result that atrazine was turning the male frogs into females. 
And then the corporation companies got pissed off at him for telling people the truth about atrazine. They tried to get him fired. They caused all kinds of trouble for this guy. Uh, but he didn't care. He kept it. He kept his published, and he published even more on the same thing. Cause, and he said something kind of honorable. He said, you know, I was lucky enough to be given a scholarship to go to Harvard and learn how to do research or go to Ivy League school. I think it was Harvard. And, uh, and so I'm going to do real research and tell people the truth, something useful. Uh, but that just shows you. I'm, I'm telling you. Lots of scientists, if they tell the truth about something, they get in trouble. All of a sudden, you know, some corporate uses money to bribe, you know, administrators at their university, and then they try to fire the guy, or they try to, you know, get their their articles retracted from the journals. That's why you have to learn how to read stuff and use common sense. You can't just get the answer looking at studies, because corporations are always going to make a whole bunch of studies that exaggerate the benefits of their product, and they're going to do everything they can to get rid of papers written by guys like this who tell the truth about their product. Okay, so here's another article by Tyrone Hayes, the same guy writing about atrazine causing complete feminization and chemical castration in males. So that's an important word, chemical castration, chemical castration. Do you really want to be eating this stuff yourself? Do you really want to feed this to your kids? You can't just be lazy about feeding your kids or yourself or you're going to end up having health problems that you don't want. And so in this article by Hayes, he shows, look at this. This is two frogs, their brothers, having sex with each other because one of them was fed atrazine and was feminized. So that one was fed atrazine and feminized. And so, you know, look at the position of their activity there. Is that doggy style or froggy style? And you take a food, corn, which is a good thing in, in populations that eat organic corn grown locally, but then you take the modern westernized version of corn sprayed with all this atrazine, it's no longer a health food. It's detrimental to health. Okay, I wouldn't eat it. Um, so anyways, here they're talking about atrazine inhibits uh, mitochondria complexes one and three, which both pump protons from the inner mitochondrial matrix into the intramembranous space to build that proton gradient that's used for um, oxidative phosphorylation in the mitochondria to make ATP. So the point I'm saying is because atrazine uh, impairs, damages uh, electron transport in the mitochondria, that also makes it cause insulin resistance. Because remember, insulin resistance is caused by, for example, excessive dietary fat overwhelming complex 3 with electron carriers, things like com electrons coming from FADH2. And the point I'm saying is if you've already damaged the mitochondria, with something like atrazine, then it's going to be more quickly uh, made unable to handle the excessive amount of electron carriers coming in from the fat. So this just shows how damaging this stuff is. It feminizes you and it makes you more vulnerable to insulin resistance and diabetes and all the bad things that go with that. Why would anybody want that? Oh, I, hold on a sec. I, 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 I missed that. I lost a slide here. Okay, so this slide was just showing, you know, sometimes atrazine is sprayed on grass, on lawns. And a lot of people will have their dog running around in the grass and then they'll sleep with the dog in their bed and they're potentially getting atrazine or some other herbicide into their bed in that way. Oh yeah, my old house, I read all about the toxicology of all these herbicides and stuff. And then I went and gave a letter to the, the neighbors about how dangerous these herbicides were. And I, it was at the old house, which was sort of my house, my new house is kind of like owned by my wife in reality. Um, I, uh, so I used to take care of the lawn and I would just use a hand push mower. I wouldn't spray any chemicals on it. And all that happened was I got mocked for having dandelions. I got yelled at for being told I'm lowering the property value for the dandelions. I didn't care. I knew I was right. I really don't care. I know I am a super smart person who tries to do the right thing. So when idiots mock me and insult me, as happens all too often, I just ignore them. I'm thinking, like, why would I? I mean, I listen to I see if they're right or not. But, you know, if I'm getting mocked by 10 idiots, I just avoid them. And I think that's actually, you know, part of the, you know, one of the negative sides of being smart is you're always going to have idiots mocking you. So you just have to learn to ignore them. Um, okay. Effective genistein and rich diets on endocrine processing. The point was, it damages all these vertebrate animals. It's not like it's isolated to one thing. So this is from soy. Genistein fed fish had decreased sperm motility, okay? Uh, fed soy, testosterone, 
um, caused increased oxidative stress in men, and it reduced the men's testosterone level, okay? Um, male volunteers lowered testosterone levels when exposed to soy. Male, um, this is again with humans, fed ultra-processed foods. Um, they have decreased sperm motility. It's a fancy word for decreased sperm motility is asthenozoospermia, okay? So what am I saying? You're making yourself infertile by eating this processed food with the soy and its glyphosate, okay, the intrinsic estrogens of the soy, and then you're making yourself infertile with the corn and the atrazine, and even monosodium glutamate, MSG, is associated with reproductive dysfunction, okay? So what I'm saying is the average American is an ignoramus who chemically castrates themselves, and, you know, they, are, they end up uh, impotent at a young age, and they end up fat and predisposed to diabetic, and then they're all sad, and then you come along and you try to tell them you should eat low-fat, low-sodium vegan, and they get annoyed with that. And I can tell you, I've had lots of people say to me, I would rather die than stop eating meat. Or, And, of course, the most common thing they say is, I eat healthy chicken and fish. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah, and then also I've had so many fat, stupid people say to me, why don't you want to enjoy life? You know, we're having cake or some other thing. And I'll say, you know what? Being fat and diabetic and impotent, I don't think that's going to make me enjoy life anymore. I'm polite about it, but that's like their mentality, you know. Sort of like there's this whole modern thing of it's cool to be stupid. You know, you walk into a room and everybody's looking at their cell phone and nobody talks to each other. It's sort of a modern insanity. Um, all right, soy formula on the vaginal epithelium. This researcher, Margaret Agent, she's done a lot of research on soy, showing how it's damaging to the female reproductive tract. It's damaging to the vagina, it's damaging to the uterus, and damaging to the fallopian tubes, okay? So, you know, next time you hear somebody say, oh, soy is this wonderful health food, have they read these papers? I guarantee you that they haven't, because I've heard a lot of people promoting soy on the Internet and I've never seen a single one of them discuss any of these papers. I've never seen a single one of them discuss these intrinsic problems with it. Okay, here's another one. Three women with abnormal bleeding problems, they stop the soy and then they get better. And a lot of times, too, you look at the original animal data and it's going to be more honest. There's no money at stake. Nobody's trying to promote anything. Here's a paper coming out of Massachusetts General Hospital, the Harvard Hospital. They used to call it MGH, Man's Greatest Hospital. You know, obviously they're pretty arrogant. But the reason I show you this is, so this is humans, men, who were eating more soy foods. They had 41 million fewer sperm per, per milliliter of sperm. Okay, 41 million fewer. Gee, I wonder why so many people are infertile. Okay, and uh, basically... Between this combination of almost most processed foods that have MSG or MFG, manufactured free glutamate, and some soy, and these glyphosate and atrazine, quite often high fructose corn syrup, all these ignoramuses, because they don't know any better, they're chemically castrating themselves. And I'm telling you, infertility is so much more common than um, used to be the case. It, it, there's a massive amount of this. And what happens is, a lot of people, a lot of women, they want to get more and more educated than they used to. And, you know, the men too, they don't want to have a kid until they've worked for more years, established some money. And guess what? They're becoming impotent and infertile, and they never can have a child because of this. That's a common problem. Okay, now here's a painting of, so I'm sorry to, you know, go through all those negative things, but you need to know them. That's how you avoid a problem is by knowing that it could happen. So here's these, uh, at the this painting called The Fountain of Youth by Lucas Cranach from 1546. These old people come to one side of the Fountain of Youth, and as they bathe in these blessed waters, they become more youthful by the time they get to the other side of the pool, and then they come out on the other side of the pool, young and beautiful, and, and then romance follows and the big feast, and isn't it wonderful? So, you know, we're never going to be 18 years old again, but you could definitely uh, make yourself a lot younger. You get all your arteries open, your Johnson's going to work better, your skin's going to have a glow of youthful vitality. You're going to look a lot better, you're going to feel a lot better, and you're going to be healthier, and you're going to be likely to live longer. It's all good. Okay, and I'm just showing, you know, so another painting here on an upbeat note. This is, I think, perhaps the most beautiful landscape painting of all time. It's called Among the Sierra Nevada Mountains by Albert Beardstad from 1868. And it's just absolutely beautiful. And I was at Yellowstone 
many years ago, uh, back when I lived out in California. And I love this quote by Marcus Aurelius. You know, he was the emperor of Rome, 121 to 180 AD. He lived. It's a sort of a stoic quote. He says, a man should be like a rocky cliff, like this rocky cliff. And all day long, the waves will break against its feet and ankles, but the cliff stands firm. And so, you know, what I get from that is basically know who you are, what you stand for, and be who you are. And yeah, you're going to be sort of hassled by a bunch of little things and tedious things every day and some big things too. But you just be solid and steadfast in who you are and what you are, and you'd be a lot happier and more resilient. Um, and I think religion is really helpful to people, super helpful to people. Christianity is the one I'm most familiar with. But it's true of other religions as well. You know, Good Book was a book by Koenig, the physician who wrote The Healing Power of Faith. You know, it tells you your life is meaning, that you have a meaningful relationship with God, and, you know, that what you do counts. Uh, I love this quote by Ayn Rand. She lived from 1905 to 1982. Her quote is, Art is a concretization of metaphysics. And what that means is, her, she wrote this book called The Romantic Manifesto. It's, it's a masterpiece. It's a brilliant book about art, including not just literature, but also painting and other types of art. So basically, the art you produce is an indicator of your philosophy, your values in life. And so, you know, a great painting sort of encapsulates all that in a concise fashion as possible. And we need that because, you know, if you just look, for example, at the Ten Commandments, yes, that's good, but it's even more powerful see, to see the lives of, you know, great people who lived in the past. You know, a great prophet or Jesu Christu or a great saint or something. And you can perceive, like, what would they do in this situation, you know? Things like quotes from St. Augustine. Right is right even if no one is doing it, and wrong is wrong even if everyone is doing it. And those types of things help to guide you um, to live a better life, okay? I like this quote from Arthur Schopenhauer. He was a German philosopher, lived 1788 to 1860, and he said, The best source of happiness comes from who the man is. A happy life is impossible. The highest a man can achieve is a heroic life. And I actually think that's a good quote. You'll, you'll find your happiness not when you're so much looking for happiness, but just when you're doing something that you think is good. Quite often that involves helping other people. But it also can involve just knowing you have an interest or a talent for something and you put big effort into it. That makes you happy. Um, when you respect yourself, your main relationship in life is with yourself. When you respect yourself and you know you did the best you could for your circumstances, you're happy. Um, you know, the Watson, the co-discoverer of the structure of DNA, he said, an animal is happy when it does what it's supposed to, what it was made for, so to speak. A horse is happy when it runs, okay? And I think there's some truth in that. You know, like I said, too, I had a conversation with my kid. One of my sons was about 20 years old, and he was kind of sad, didn't know what he wanted to study in college. And he saw me kind of walking by with a big smile on my face, and he's like, why are you so happy, Dad? Your life sucks. Go, what do you mean? He goes, your life sucks. All you do is work and study. He said, if I had a life like yours, I would hate it. I mean, why don't you go to the beach with mom or something? I said, I don't want to go to the beach. I waste my whole day. I think those sunscreens are toxic. I don't want to put that on my body. I can go outside and sit in the sun for 30 minutes and I get all the vitamin D I need. I'm happy, and I, I, you know, I have a talent for for study and scholar and books. I I feel like I can look into these books and quite often understand them as well as anyone in the whole world, and I enjoy that. Okay, and um, so, anyways, each person has to find for themselves what makes them happy. Um, Helen Keller was an amazing lady. She lived from 1880 to 1968, and here's one quote from her. She said, "Happiness comes from loyalty to a worthy purpose." Um, so, yeah, I liked her biography as well. I went and I read all these biographies of all the geniuses, all the saints, as many of them as I could, and I learned a lot from that. And um, that's a pretty common thing. You only have so much time left on this planet. So figure out what's important to you, what you value, what you want to try to achieve. Help people as much as you can, especially, you know, your, your closest loved ones. And by devoting your life to that good purpose, you sort of like, in a sense, make your life a work of art to that purpose and knowing that you're doing the best you can with your life makes you happy. So it works. And then to the extent that it's possible, you're always going to have disappointments and sadness and frustrations and things out of your control. 
but you do the best you can and you're nice to the people around you. They're nice to the people around them. You sort of create that outward ripple effect and you can make life closer to spring as it's going to get. And this beautiful painting here, Primavera or Spring by Sandro Botticelli from 1493. And I think that's about the best we can do. So anyways, hope that was helpful. And, and that concludes the series of nine lectures on the causes of obesity.